Well, I'm glad to see everyone this morning, and I'm excited to be able to preach this morning. Uh, there's not going to be any children's church today, so uh, we have some coloring sheets. I think they're out there on the welcome table, so if your child would benefit from using one of those or just to keep them distracted for a minute. Um, Amanda, she's not here this morning because she has shingles, so if you would keep her in your prayers. Um, she said she was going to be watching online. So if she is, I want to see at 10.01 for it to say amen on there from Amanda, to just in the comment section. There we go. And if I don't see it on there, I'll know if she wasn't watching. So, yeah, keep her in check. Um, <laughs> if you're a guest, we're excited that you've chosen to join us, and we hope that you feel right at home. And it's such an honor to be able to preach the opening message to our countdown to Easter with a message that I've titled, The Hour Has Come. I thank the Lord for allowing me this opportunity to preach. I'm also thankful for having a lead pastor, Pastor Josh, who is so patient with me as I learn the ins and outs of being an associate pastor as being a youth pastor. So blessed to have the opportunity to learn from the example that he sets. And I want to thank everyone who's committed their Sunday to coming here this morning to hear the word of God being preached and proclaimed, to worship together. And for watching online, like my wife, because of health issues, we're praying for your health and well-being. If you're watching online because you're at work, or you watch this later because you're working, we pray for your safety. And if you're watching online simply because you didn't want to get out of bed, and you didn't want to be here this morning because... You'd rather sip on your coffee and watch it on TV. I would like to encourage you to come here. There's nothing like being in the house of God, with God's people, on Sunday morning. We are told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, about stirring up one another and encouraging one another. And that's hard to do through the comment section on Facebook or in YouTube comments. It's much better when you're face-to-face as it was meant to be. There's just something about being together as God's family. So whether you're here in the room or watching online, I hope that this morning's message would bless you, that you would learn something from it, that it would, you would get from it as much as I've gotten from it. I've learned so much, and I've, I've had so many things come to my mind and received into my heart as I read and I studied, learning the deeper meaning and the truths of the high priestly prayer, which we'll be talking about in chapter 17 of John. But we're not going to turn there just yet, because I want you guys to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Are you ready, to, ready for what God has in store for us this morning? It's okay to say amen. All right. Well, I am. After looking at a few verses in Matthew, we'll be going uh, to look at John where we remain for the rest of the message. And uh, I'm going to briefly go through the prior events in Scripture that took place leading up to John 17. So we're going to start back at Matthew, and it's going to be brief. I'm going to go through it, and there's going to be a couple large chunks that I'm going to read just to get us up to where we're at in John 17 when Jesus is praying the prayer to God the Father. I want you to keep that in mind as we're going through here, saying he's going through it pretty quick. That's why. Um, but Jesus... He, he's uh, before the high priestly prayer, he's, uh, even his 12 disciples were down to 11 at the time of the prayer. Judas Iscariot had already left to go betray Jesus by taking 30 pieces of silver from the high priest. And that's where this verse is that you guys are looking at. So let's go ahead and read that really quick. We see in Matthew 26, verse 14 through 16, it says, Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment on, he sought an opportunity to betray him. From this moment, we're going to move forward to the Passover, where the Lord's Supper will be instituted. And you'll see that in John chapter 13. That's on page 900 on the Bibles in the pew rack. And we say it every Sunday. If you don't have a Bible, take one of those home. If you don't have one and you know a friend that doesn't have one, take two home. Take two of those Bibles or yours. That's our gift to you. But that's on page 900 in that. And then and John is where we will remain for the rest of the service. So if you would, turn to John chapter 13. 
And in John chapter 13, verse 1, John writes, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and all he had, and all he had come from, from God, was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. From here, Jesus proceeds to wash the disciples' feet, including Judas's feet. While we're still in the upper room, Jesus says in verse 21, one of you will betray me. So let's read uh, John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. And you've got to remind you, I'm not going to break this down. This is just a lead up to uh, chapter 17. So let's read in John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, who we believe to be John, who was leaning back to speak to Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel of bread, he gave it to Judas, the, Simon of, uh, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what you need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. So now we're going to look at, uh, we're down to 11 disciples. And Jesus is in the upper room. Jesus goes on to give them a new commandment, and that's to love one another. He also tells Peter that he will deny him three times. He tells his disciples in chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He speaks about how he is the true vine and his father is the vine dresser. He speaks to them about the hatred of the world. Jesus tells them in chapter 15, verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. In chapter 16, Jesus says in verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. He's talking to his disciples here in the upper room. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. He's talking about after his death. You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. They'll rejoice because Jesus died. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And the last verse of chapter 16, if you want to go ahead and turn over there. The last verse of chapter 16 is verse 33, where Jesus tells them, I have said these things to you, that in me, or that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So now we've seen where we go from the upper room, where Jesus starts talking to them when they're preparing for the Passover feast, and now we're all the way up to the point where he's telling them everything that's about to happen, and that's the last thing he says to his disciples before he has the high priestly prayer, where he speaks to God the Father, and then they go into the Garden of Gethsemane. So that was the last thing that he says to his disciples before they cross over to Gethsemane. We've arrived at a very special place in Scripture in chapter 17. We're arriving at a place where when we get to listen in on one of the longest or the longest recorded prayer by Jesus. We believe this prayer took place in the upper room right before they left. And in this prayer, Jesus prays three specific things. He prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and he prays for us as future believers. If you are a born-again believer here this morning, he is praying for you. And that takes place in chapter 17. Now I want to start looking at verses 1 through 5. So if you would read with me. And I'm going to break it down into sections. We'll have the first section. That will be where Jesus prays for himself. The second section where he prays for his disciples. And the third section where he prays for us. So when I'm saying first section, second section, that's what I'm speaking about. So let's read in the first section verses 1 through 5. There are a few things that I'd like to break down once we get done. 
starting in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes, or he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to eternal life, to, who, to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Out of those five verses, I almost could do an entire sermon off of those five. And you'd think that's crazy, and I would too. But once I got to studying and looking into everything, it's so deep, it's unreal. And we're going to touch on just a little bit of it. I had, to, I had to back off of it because I thought I still got these two other chunks to go before we're done. And if we want to get out of here before tomorrow, we, we're going to... We're just going to go through these, the main highlights in it. So uh, there's a few things I want to break down about it. In verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes up to heaven. That's Jesus assuming a, uh, a common posture of prayer for Jews back in that day, lifting his eyes up towards heaven when he's praying. In verse 1, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Now it's time to reveal himself for who he really is. Now it's time for him to give up his life. Now it's time for him to go back to the Father. The hour has come. It's time for him to fulfill his purpose, what he came here to do. Now is the time. The hour has come. At the end of verse 1, Jesus says, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. This is where I went down the trail, and I could have stayed on it for quite a while, but I'm just going to give you guys what the main points of it. At the end of that verse, when he says, glorify your son that the son may glorify you, there are two passages in Isaiah that speaks to this verse. One of them is Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory. I give to no other. He doesn't give his glory to anybody else. Let's look at another one in Isaiah. Chapter 48, verse 11, where he says, For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should, I be, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. That's back in the Old Testament. Now, if you look at the end of verse 1 in our text in chapter 17, if Isaiah, what Isaiah is saying there, that means that Jesus is God. That he's not just some prophet, that he's not just some teacher, that he's not just some really good guy, but that he's God. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. This is one of the many verses that affirms the deity of Christ, that he is who he says he is. That Jesus is a part of the Holy Trinity. Jesus is God. There are many uh, scholars and historians, Christian and non-Christian, who attest to the existence of Jesus as a man who lived on earth. They'll say that he was a man, but he wasn't God if you're not Christian. Any true historian or scholar won't even listen to you if you're that person that says, Jesus wasn't even a real man, it never even existed. They won't take you serious. And I've looked up a few people on here, and I'm going to give you two examples. Paul Mayer, an ancient history professor at Western Michigan, says this. Open nearly any text in ancient history of Western civilization used widely in colleges and universities today, and you will find a generally sympathetic, if compressed, version of Jesus' life, which ends with some variation of the statement that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate and died as a result. No ranking historian anywhere in the world shares the ultimate criticism that Jesus was a myth. Second guy I'm going to tell you, and the last one is Bart Ehrman, a professor at the University of North Carolina, an outspoken critic of Christianity, the New Testament, and religion in general, says this, he, talking about Jesus, he certainly existed as virtually every competent scholar of antiquity, Christian or non-Christian, will agree. So there's plenty of scholars, plenty of historians that do their research, and they might not believe in the deity of Christ, but they will tell you that he did exist. So then the question isn't, did Jesus really exist? That's not the question at hand. The question is not, is he real? The question would be, is he really the son of God? That's the real question. Is he really the son of God? If we truly believe that God's word is without error, if we truly believe that what he says is true, then he is the son of God. That he not only existed, past tense, but he still exists because he is the son of God. 
because he is God. Jesus Christ is Lord, always has been, always will be. I believe this prayer has many truths and many purposes. I can't even begin to unravel the depth of this prayer. If I spent the rest of my life studying it, I truly wouldn't comprehend the depth of what Jesus was talking about to God the Father. And here I have under an hour to explain it. Jesus knew that we'd be reading and studying this prayer thousands of years later. He knew that you and I would be sitting here this very morning, going through his words to God the Father just hours before his arrest. You got to think of everything that's going on through his mind. But what did he have on his mind? His glory, his disciples, and us. Those three things. Just hours before he would be betrayed, hours before the Roman soldiers would flog him, hours before the priest, the high priest, would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. After they flogged him, it wasn't enough. That's not enough. Crucify him. Jesus knowing this is coming the whole time. That's why I said this is a very special place in Scripture. Now let's look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what, um, eternal life is knowing God. But the knowledge is not just a head knowledge. It's a relationship with him. We're going to talk about that. A relationship with the one true God. I read a commentary by Craig Evans. He said this about knowing. That word knowing says the Hebrew notion of knowing encompasses experience and intimacy. For Christians, this means obedience and love. Moreover, such knowledge must include a commitment to Jesus Christ, God's Son. That's how you know him, by a commitment you've made to him, not just a head knowledge, not just that scholarly knowledge that we just spoke about but having a true relationship with him. So yes, you must know the one and only true God, but how you know him is vitally important. How you know him is vitally important. Do you deny his existence altogether? Do you have a false view of who he really is? Mormonism, just to name one of a billion different religions that say they know who Jesus is, or that he is was God, is a prophet some way, shape, or form, you could have a false view of him. So do you deny him altogether? Do you have a false view of him? Or do you just know about him, know he's God, but could care less? Or you won't submit to him. Satan and the demons didn't submit to him. They know he exists. They know who he is. When he was here on earth, they were terrified of him. They know who Jesus is. But they didn't care. And they did not submit to him. I pray your answer to any of the questions that I just ask is not yes. I pray you would know God in a way that saves a belief and a faith that Jesus is who he says he is. You know, I say that a lot. And I got to thinking about that. I tell that to the youth. Believe what Jesus says. Believe that he is who he says he is. Well, what did he say about himself? Well, who did he say he was? So I, got, I looked at it. Let's, let's read but you don't have to turn there. Mark chapter 14, verses 61 through 64. This is when he's before the high priest. And they ask him point blank. We'll read right here. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as a serving death. Why was the high priest outraged? Why was they outraged? Why did they tear the garments and accuse Jesus of blasphemy? For the same reason they all condemned him as deserving death. Because he claimed to be the son of God. Because he claimed to be the Messiah. The Christ. Do you believe and have a faith that Jesus is who he says he is? Because that's who he says he is. Do you believe that today? Now let's look at verses 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus said that he had accomplished the work that he had been given to do here on earth. The work of revealing the Father through his life and ministry had come to an end. He was at the last, 
sorry. He was on the last leg of his race here on earth. The hour had come. All that's left was his death, resurrection, and ascension. That was all that remained before he would return to God the Father in glory. Again, we see in verse 5, we're talking about the deity of Christ. Is Jesus God? Well, at the end of it, right there, it says, clear as day. With the glory that I had with you before the world existed. If he's not God, he can't be with God before the world existed. Jesus is God. Now let's read verses uh, 6. Actually, actually, um, there's more I'd like to cover on this, but I'm going to move on to the second section. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go ahead and move on. We're going to go ahead and move on to the second section of this prayer. We should do a study on this sometime, huh? Um, let's move to the second section of the prayer where Jesus is praying for his disciples. And the second section is verses 6 through 19. 6 through 19. And I want to break this section down in two halves. The first half we're going, to boot, we're going to read through 6 through 11, break that down, and then we're going to do the second half of that section, we're going to do 12 through 19. And then after that, we're just going to hit where he prays for us, all in one section, 20 through 26. So let's begin by reading verses 6 through 11. It says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you have sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm counting and I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. There's a lot to break down right there. So let's go ahead and start by looking at verse 6. Um, and I want to focus on the, a couple of these words. It says, I have manifested your name. Now, I don't know if a lot of people know what the word manifested means. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the Oxford Dictionary of it. The word manifested means in the Oxford Dictionary, to display or show by one's acts or appearance, to demonstrate. I have manifested your name. I have displayed your name. I have shown your name through acts and appearance. I have demonstrated your name. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Now let's look at verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8, starting with verse 7, says, Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. Anyone who's read through the Gospels knows that these disciples were ordinary men. They weren't scholars of their day. They weren't high priests. They were just ordinary men. They were fishermen. They did just normal trades of work. They were no different than you or I. There was nothing truly exceptional about them, including their faith. But they did believe in Jesus. They did believe what they told him, what, they, what he had told them. They believed the truth that he revealed to them. This is how we know they belong to God. Do you believe in Jesus and accept the truth of his words like the disciples did? If not, I pray that God would convict you through the power of his word this morning. I pray that you would believe in Jesus and accept the truth as those disciples accepted the truth. Let's continue by reading verses 9 through 10. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And here we see that Jesus prays specifically for the disciples and not the world. We see that specifically he says that. This doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't care about the world. In fact, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Think about it. Jesus was praying for his disciples, preparing them to go out to all the nations so that the world would be believe that God sent him. It's for a purpose. Just because Jesus doesn't pray for the world in his prayer doesn't mean that he doesn't care about the world. I'm sure a few of you are having a verse come to mind right about now that Jesus loves the world, right? Not, God says God to love the world, right? John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. So when he's praying this prayer, it's just because he's focusing on the disciples and not the world. Not that he doesn't love the world. Love the people in the world. Let's go ahead and look at verse 11. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. Here we see Jesus praying for unity. We'll see something, <laughs> we'll talk about unity in the next section. Because that's basically what he prays for us as future believers. But for now, he's praying for uni the unity of his disciples. He prays that the disciples are one as he and the Father are one. That's powerful if you think about it. As he and the Father are one. Think about the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to separate them because they are one. He's praying that the disciples are one as he and the Father are one. Being impossible to separate them. You know, I don't, this wasn't in my notes, and I didn't really even think to say it, but I was thinking about what I've heard people say when they look at pictures of me when I was in the military, or they look at boot camp pictures. And there's one a picture of me where I'm in front of a Humvee in Iraq, and I showed the youth group, and I said, which one am I? Do you guys remember that that was in there? I asked which one I was, and it took them a minute, and they even picked the wrong one a few times. They said, well, you all guys look the same. Y'all all look the same. And I said, look at the boot camp picture. It's even crazier because all of our heads are shaved. We're all about the same size. And there's hundreds of us in a lineup, and we all look the same. It doesn't matter what skin color you are. We all look the same because we all do the same thing every day together. We, our posture is the same. The way we address people is the same. And I mean, it, it's a mirror's image all the way across. Because from day one, they taught us to be one. When we're in drill, it's one movement, one sound. When our foot hit, it had to sound like one big foot hitting the ground, not a bunch of little scattered feet. We moved as one. You couldn't tell the difference from one guy to the next. And we all knew the same things. We're all taught and trained to do the same things. So if one went down, the next one took his spot, and you didn't have to worry about if he knew what to do. I think in a roundabout way, it reminds me of the disciples. He's praying that for them, that they'd be one, even as he and the Father are one. All right, let's break down the rest of, the, the rest of this passage. Verses uh, 12 through 19. Let's go ahead and read it. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may, uh, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world so that I, may, that I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Let's go and start breaking that down. Starting with verse 12. And I'm going to ask you guys a question. Do you think that Jesus kept and guarded his disciples because of their goodness? Do you think that Jesus kept and guarded those disciples because of their conduct? No. No, not, not, absolutely not. Because Jesus guarded and kept them because they belonged to him. They belonged to him. Thank the Lord, salvation of the believer does not depend upon our conduct or upon anything that we think, what's on our heart, our goodness. Because if it did, we would be disqualified every second of the day. Every second of the day. Our salvation is dependent upon our belief in Jesus Christ. Our faith in him and our faith alone is what saves us. Judas, the son of destruction, was disqualified because he either didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God or quite possibly he didn't care because, like I said, there are people that know who Jesus is and they just don't care. They saw the miracles. They saw everything he did for three years. And if I seen that, 
I'd like to think that it would change my mind if I saw that. He's seen it, and it didn't change or sway him one way or the other. He's a very selfish man. We'll talk about him here in a second. Actually, we're going to talk about him right now. Some think that God made Judas for the sole purpose of betraying Jesus. Poor Judas Iscariot. He never had a chance. God made him for that reason. Judas was given the same freedoms and opportunities that everyone else is. The same freedoms and opportunities that all the other disciples had. God did not make that choice for him. I love what Tony Evans says about this. I told, I told you, Josh, I wasn't going to bring this quote up, but I, I'm going to bring it up. I, I love this too much not to quote this, and it speaks perfectly to this part about Judas. It says, God knew far in advance that Judas would betray the Messiah. Nevertheless, Judas' rebellion could not thwart the divine plan. On the contrary, it facilitated it. Understand that even wickedness falls under the sovereignty of God, not because God prescribes it, but because he uses it. How much better would it be for you to fulfill God's purposes through your obedience than through your rebellion? End of the quote. That hit me when I read it. God's going to use you one way or the other. He's going to use you one way or the other. He used Pharaoh. Knowing his heart, he hardened it. Knowing Judas, he used him. He didn't make him that way. That's Judas' choice. He had the same freedoms that you and I have right now that people every day choose to not follow Jesus. He just decided to take 30 pieces, 30 pieces of silver for it. But it's the same, same, same opportunities that we have right now. Let's continue reading verse 13. Verse 13. If I can find it. Okay, here we go. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So in this verse, Jesus focuses on coming back to the Father. The thought of the physical and mental toll of what was about to happen, it had to have brought him some anxiety. It had to have worried him and brought him concern. But the thought of his resurrection and returning to the Father had to have brought joy and peace beyond anything we could understand. But not only would it bring joy and peace to him, his resurrection, it would bring joy and peace to his disciples, and he knew it would. It brings joy and peace to us today. Because if Jesus doesn't raise from the grave, we're no better off than, than anybody else. But what sets us apart from other people is because we believe that Jesus rose from the dead because he did. That's what sets us apart. And we can have joy knowing that. That's what we're counting down to in this series. Starting with this message. It's a countdown to Easter Sunday. Let's continue by reading verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we see in verse 14 that the world hated them, and despite the hatred, Jesus prayed for them not to be taken out of the world. They're going to be hated, persecuted, but Jesus doesn't pray for them to be taken out. Why? Why, doesn't, why does Jesus want to leave them in a place where they're going to be persecuted, hated, murdered? Why would he want to leave them in that? So that they would testify to his name, so they would spread the gospel message. Such a task has not been put upon us. Ours is much easier. They might hate us a little bit. They might not like what, like what we do, but they're not going to treat us the way they did the disciples back in that day. They do in other parts of the world today, but not here. I'm not going to get off on that tangent. You guys, we are called to spread the gospel message. And that's what these guys did. That's why Jesus left them here. Because God so loved the world, right? That's why he left them here. They bore witness to Jesus Christ. Let's read verses 17 through 19. Finish up this section. 17. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Now there's a couple of words here that I'd like to define so we can better understand verses 17 through 19. The first word is that word sanctify. Now sanctify means setting apart for a special use or a special purpose. That's what the word sanctify means. Now uh, the word uh, consecrate, the word consecration means the separation of oneself <clears throat> from things that are unclean, 
especially something that would contaminate one's relationship with God. So in short, Jesus is praying for his disciples to be set apart for God's special purpose, for his special task. And for their sakes, Jesus did not contaminate himself, which he couldn't. It's impossible for him to do so. But he kept himself uncontaminated for that reason. So God the Father may, be, may set them apart for his special purpose. I like what the uh, New Living Translation says on this verse. And the New Living Translation puts it like this. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they may be made holy by your truth. I like using uh, dependable translations. And I like defining words in like the English standard version. We talk about David in some of our classes and when he went up against Goliath and you have all these different measurements and stuff like that and you're like, what is that? What, what measurement? What does that even mean? How heavy is that in pounds? And so the New Living Translation does that. It puts it in an easier way to understand it. So I like to use that from time to time. Um, who, uh, who are the last people that Jesus prays for before he's betrayed? It's us. Obviously, I'm, spoiler, I've already, already told us. Um, I just wanted to break down the verses in, the, in these right here before we moved on. So let's go ahead and move on to the last section of prayer, which is verses 20 through 26, where Jesus is praying for us. Now, like I said, if, that's you, if you're a born-again believer, that's you. He prays for future believers. And what exactly does he pray for future believers moments before his betrayal? He prays for our unity. I told you I was going to come back to that. He prays for our unity. Um, he prays for our unity. There is a peace in National Geographic that I would quickly like to read before reading this section. The May 1987 edition of National Geographic included a feature, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> included a feature, I'm going to have to get a drink of water. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Throat's getting dry. <clears throat> I was trying to make it through the whole service without doing that. I've been fighting it for about five minutes. Um, it says the May 1987 edition of National Geographic included a feature about the Arctic wolf. Author L. David Meck described how a seven-member pack had targeted several musk oxen calves who were guarded against 11 adults. As the wolves approached their quarry, the musk oxen bunched in an impenetrable semicircle, their deadly hooves facing out, and the calves remained safe during a long standoff with the enemy. But then a single oxen broke rank. The herd scattered into nervous little groups. A skirmish ensued, and the adults finally fled in panic, leaving the calves to the mercy of the predators. Not a single calf survived. Wolves attack believers every single day. The enemy's out there, and it's, it's, he's ruthless. When we have the unity that Jesus prays for us in verses 20 through 26, we become that impenetrable wall, making it much more difficult for the enemy to attack us. Is it impossible? No. But it makes it much more difficult. It's vital for believers to be unified. I love the picture of strength and protection in this example. But this is just a byproduct of unity. It's not the main purpose for it. Unity has a lot of upside of being together, being one, strength, accountability, all those things. But there is a main purpose that unity is used for. We're going to read exactly what unity is used for in 20 through 26. So if you would... Read uh, verses 20 through 21 with me. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they, may be, that they may be one just as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Right there. Wants all of us to be as one so that the world will believe that Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father. That reason is why we are to be unified. There's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of awesome things that come from that, being unified. Now, <laughs> I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to give you guys a pop quiz over one of the words that I mentioned earlier. And I'm going to quote a pastor that I'd heard talk about unity. He says, we are caught up in something much bigger than us. We are called to serve the Lord in unity so that the love and glory of our Trinitarian God is visibly and powerfully manifested to a watching world. Does anybody remember what that word manifested means? It's okay, you can say it out loud. I'm actually listening for it. One of the three words that I used. Huh? Demonstrate. There's one. 
Is that what you said? You say demonstrate? Somebody, I thought I heard a voice over here. Display. Display. There it is again. Awesome. So you guys are paying attention. Yay. All right. Um, so it means displayed, shown, demonstrated. Uh, we are to display, show, demonstrate to a watching world the love and glory of the Lord through our unity. We're supposed to show them. It's supposed to be a display for the entire world. Now let's finish by reading verses 24 through 26. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you who have, you have sent me, and made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, and the love with which you loved may be in them and I in them. The final prayer before the betrayal of Jesus, shows us what was on the heart of God. His glory, his disciples, who the world would eventually hate, and us as future believers and our unity. The very next verse is in chat. Y'all don't have to go there. The very next verse, and this kind of just tees it up for the rest of the series, is chapter 18, verse 1, and I'll read it for you. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. The countdown has begun. The hour has come. Worship team, would you please come forward? Between now and Easter, there will be betrayal, denial, pain, and sacrifice leading up to it. But it will ultimately end in victory. I want you guys to be here for this. Invite your family and friends. Maybe you're hearing this for the first time. You're saying to yourself, I want to be a believer. I want to belong to Jesus. I want to be saved. There's nothing more I would love to talk to you about. There's nothing more Pastor Josh would love to talk to you about than coming to Christ. Let me tell you, friend, now's the time. Give your life to Jesus this morning. I want you to, if you want to be baptized, water's warm. <laughs> It's going right now. If you want to do it right now, we would love to do it. If you'd love to get baptized some other time, come up here and let us know. If you want to be a member of First Baptist Church of Queen, come let me and Josh know. But we'll be here up at the front. An altar is open for anyone who wants to come up here and pray for yourself or a family member. And again, if you're that person that wants to your, give your life to Jesus, please come and speak to us.